Hi, I'm Father Michael Gately. I'm a priest in the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception, and I was invited to share a reflection with you about Divine Mercy Sunday. Specifically, I'm going to talk about what I call the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, of course, this year's celebration is unique for all of us, including for us here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. For instance, this weekend we normally see tens of thousands of pilgrims here to celebrate, but now everybody's at home practicing social distancing. So here it's just our Lord, myself, and my fellow Marian priests and brothers. Now I have to admit that under other circumstances, I'd be very happy to have this beautiful shrine pretty much all to myself. But as we're filming this on the eve of Divine Mercy Sunday, I can't help feeling sad both for you and for Jesus. I'm sad for you because you probably have to stay at home and aren't able to receive Jesus in the Eucharist at Mass. And I'm sad for Jesus because I'm sure he misses your receiving him even more than you do. But there's something else that I'm sure is making many of you feel sad. In fact, it's the reason I agreed to hastily make this video. All right, so what is it? What's making many of you so sad? Well, of course, we're all sad because so many people are dying or have died of the coronavirus. We're also sad because many others are losing their jobs or are experiencing major disruptions in their lives. But on top of all that, many of you are sad because you're thinking that you're going to have to miss out on the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, the great grace that Jesus himself promised us through St. Faustina. Now, in our present circumstances, that last sadness is about the only thing I can help take away, so I'd like to at least try to do that. But in case you don't know what the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is, or maybe have forgotten the details, I'm going to start by saying something about it. Actually, before that, I think it'll be helpful to say a few things about St. Faustina. So it's going to be Faustina, the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, and whether or not you can receive that grace this year. All right, so let's start with Faustina. St. Maria Faustina Kowalska was a Polish mystic to whom Jesus appeared on the eve of World War II and during the Great Depression to give the church through her the modern message of divine mercy. Now, it's not that God gave her some new gospel. Rather, he gave her a message that brings the whole church back to the very heart of the gospel, which is God's mercy for sinners. Now, a key point here is this. The message of divine mercy that comes to us through St. Faustina is about bringing the whole church back to the heart of the gospel. Again, the whole church. And that's something very important, because it indicates that St. Faustina isn't just one saint or mystic among many. Rather, she stands out as someone very special. Let me put it this way. As a priest who talks a lot about St. Faustina and her message, I get inundated with information about private revelations, mystics, apparitions, and new devotions. Now, there's no question that mystical phenomena and religious devotions are a blessed part of the tradition of the church. However, sometimes it could be a bit much. For instance, I know that priests like myself can at times hear things like this. Oh, Father, have you heard about the new devotion to the holy arrow in the eye of Jesus? Father, if you just say this prayer five times and spin around three times, all of your wildest dreams will come true. Father, you've got to tell the whole parish about this. And if you don't, Jesus is going to cry. Okay, now it's not quite that bad, and there's no holy arrow in the eye of Jesus devotion, at least not yet, but you get the idea. Now, I'm not saying that all alleged mystics and apparitions are wrong. It's just that they need to be tested. But even when they have been tested and are approved by the church, for instance, by a local bishop, they're often a message just for one diocese or one country or a particular culture. What's very rare is to have a mystic give a message for the whole church. St. Faustina is one of those very rare mystics. Both she and her message have been thoroughly vetted by ecclesial authorities, and St. John Paul II made clear that her message is not just for his native Poland, but for the whole church. And perhaps the most important way he did this was when, inspired by St. Faustina, he declared the second Sunday of Easter to be Divine Mercy Sunday, the great feast we celebrate this weekend, or at least trying to celebrate. Anyway, because Faustina and her message has not only been approved by the church at the highest levels, but also because her message has been so radically recognized by several popes as a gift for the whole church, I believe that Faustina should not be dismissed as just another mystic giving private revelations. Rather, I suggest that she should be approached through the biblical category of prophecy. In other words, I'm saying that St. Faustina is a prophet. A prophet? Isn't that just for the Old Testament? No. 
In a certain sense, all of us, by virtue of our baptism, are prophets. And as such, we're called to announce the good news of the gospel to everyone. But prophecy is not only that. It's also meant as a very specific charism in the church. All right, so what's that? Well, first, let me just say what it's not. It's not what people often think of as prophecy, as a kind of mystical knowledge about future events. Rather, it's where the Holy Spirit raises up certain holy men and women who have a powerful experience of God that they're then called to share with the whole church for the building up of the body of Christ in a given time and for a particular reason. So if St. Faustina has this specific charism of prophecy, what's her message? Or more accurately, what's God's message to us through her? Again, it's the message of divine mercy. It's the message of God's consoling love during troubled times. Remember, Jesus appeared to Faustina on the eve of World War II and during the Great Depression. So given our present circumstances, when we sure could use some consolation, I want to talk about one of the most comforting aspects of Faustina's message. Again, it's what I call the Great Grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, there are many graces available on Divine Mercy Sunday. In fact, Jesus himself told St. Faustina, quote, On that day, Mercy Sunday, the very depths of my tender mercy are opened. I pour out a whole ocean of graces. On that day, all the divine floodgates through which graces flow are opened. And what he said really is true. At least that's been my experience. For instance, when I first learned about St. Faustina many years ago, I decided to pray for my dad on Divine Mercy Sunday, who was in need of a conversion and a healing. Well, he got both, and pretty dramatically. Now, of course, it doesn't always work out that way, but please do pray this Mercy Sunday and ask for great graces for yourself and your loved ones. But what do I mean specifically about the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, or as they often call it here at the shrine, the extraordinary promise? Well, it's this. If you go to confession so you're in the state of grace on Divine Mercy Sunday, receive Holy Communion on that day or on the vigil, and desire to receive the promised grace with trust, then you will receive the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. Now, some of you are probably saying, Father Mike, that's salt in the wounds. I can't get to confession or receive communion because I'm stuck at home. Well, we'll come back to that. But until then, let's stay on this topic of the great grace. All right, so what is it? What's the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday? It's nothing less than a total cleansing of all sin and punishment due to sin. Here's how Jesus himself put it to St. Faustina. The soul that will go to confession and receive Holy Communion will obtain complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. Now think of that for a minute. Complete forgiveness of sins and punishment. That's a big deal. As one great theologian, a friend of Pope John Paul II put it, that grace is like a second baptism. Of course, it's not actually a baptism, but it so thoroughly cleanses the soul that it's as if you were just baptized and became as clean of soul as a newly baptized baby. Again, that's a big deal. Why? Because even if we've been forgiven our sins, there's still what's called the temporal punishment due to sin, which leads to purgatory. And what's purgatory? It's that gift of God's love that allows us, after death, to be purified of any stain of sin that prevents us from entering into the full presence of the all-holy God. And it's apparently pretty painful. Well, the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday cleanses us so completely that if we died right after receiving it, we would not need to pass through purgatory. In fact, we'd go straight to heaven, straight to the full embrace of God's merciful love. Now you might be saying, ah, oh, that's just a plenary indulgence, and you can get that for reading 30 minutes of Scripture. Well, it's actually not the same as a plenary indulgence, although the church does give a plenary indulgence on Divine Mercy Sunday, but that's something different. So let me take a quick tangent and explain that. To get a plenary indulgence from the church, you have to say the indulgence prayer or do the indulgence act, pray for the intentions of the Holy Father, go to confession, receive Holy Communion, and be detached from all sin. Now that last one tends to be the problem. Are we really detached from all sin? And how would we even know that? And how hard is it to be detached from all sin? Well, I once read a story that St. Philip Neri was speaking to a crowd of people who had gathered for some church event to receive a plenary indulgence, and the Holy Spirit told St. Philip that only two people in the whole crowd were going to receive the full indulgence, Philip himself and a seven-year-old boy, presumably because everyone else was attached to sin. So it might not be as easy as we think to get a plenary indulgence. Thankfully, though, if we aim for one and miss, we still get a partial indulgence. 
On the other hand, the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is relatively easy to obtain. Why? Because being detached from all sin is not one of the conditions for receiving it. Again, you just have to be in the state of grace, receive Holy Communion, desire to receive the grace, and trust that you will receive it. That's pretty easy. And it's a sign of the great tenderness of the Lord that He would make it so easy. And yet, in a certain sense, it's not so easy to receive the grace. Now, I say that because there are some big obstacles that often prevent people from getting what should be a very easy grace to obtain. My goal then for the rest of our time together is to demolish those obstacles so you can receive the consoling gift of the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. So the first obstacle, the obstacle to desire. Now, one of the conditions for receiving the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is to desire it. But to desire it, you first need to know that it's being offered. Well, now you know, and so I hope you desire it. I hope that your heart is now burning to receive the freely given gift of a total cleansing of all your sin and punishment due to sin. I hope you now want the second baptism. It's not really a baptism, but probably feels like it to the soul. So if that's what you want, then you've already met one of the very few conditions required to receive it. But there's another obstacle, obstacle two, the obstacle to trust. So a second condition for receiving the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is that you have to trust that you will receive it. And that should be easy. After all, we have the testimony of Jesus himself through St. Faustina telling us that he wants to give it to us. Problem is, there are sometimes well-meaning people who say that it's just not possible. But it is possible. The reality is the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday doesn't always fit comfortably in everyone's theological categories. And that's okay, because we can make room for God and what He wants to give us. And while prophets like St. Faustina are known for shaking things up a bit, people eventually settle down and begin to accept their message. And in Faustina's case, it should be easy, because the message is so amazingly beautiful. But still, it's not always easy. And that even goes for St. Faustina. For example, there's one passage in her diary where she was writing about God's mercy, but then becomes afraid that maybe she's expressed too much, that maybe she's gone too far in writing about God's great goodness and mercy. Well, the Lord's astounding response is simply this. My daughter, what you've written is not even a drop in the ocean. And then there's this other passage where Faustina is just blown away by God's goodness to sinners. And she writes, there are moments and there are mysteries of the divine mercy over which the heavens are astounded. Let our judgment of souls cease, because God's mercy upon them is extraordinary. So with Faustina's testimony in mind, let's let our doubts about the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday cease. Let's receive what God wants to give us, even if it seems like it's too much. And let's do it because it's not too much mercy. It's exactly what God wants to give to us. And you have that not only from the testimony of St. Faustina, but it's the official position here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy, a position we're confident in because of our long history of spreading the devotion and working with Blessed Michael Sapochko, who was St. Faustina's spiritual director, with St. John Paul II, for whom the Marians worked behind the scenes to spread the message, and with many theological experts. With that vast history and experience, we at the Shrine can tell you with confidence that the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday is not too good to be true, and not just another plenary indulgence. But rather, as Jesus himself said, it's a great grace that arises from the very depths of his tender mercy for us. We here at the Shrine want you to receive this grace. St. Faustina wants you to receive this grace. But most importantly, Jesus wants you to receive this grace. So what are we waiting for? Well, there's one more obstacle that needs to come down. It's obstacle three, the obstacle of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, as we've learned to receive the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, we need to go to confession, or at least be in the state of grace, and receive Holy Communion. Now, many of you watching can't get to Mass or haven't been able to go to confession, and you're sad because you think you therefore can't get the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday. Well, I have good news for you. You can still receive the grace. Yes, even if you're not able to go to confession or attend Mass. And why am I so confident in saying that? Because of what Divine Mercy is. And what's Divine Mercy? Well, it's God's love when it encounters our poverty, weakness, brokenness, and sin. It's God's love when it encounters suffering. Now, we're all suffering today in an extraordinary way. Obviously, Jesus knows that, and so his tender mercy is going out to us. And in the midst of our extraordinary suffering, he wants to give us extraordinary grace. Otherwise, he's not divine mercy. 
but we know that he is love and mercy itself. And we at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy are convinced that he wants to give us the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, whatever our circumstances. And I say that not only because Jesus is Divine Mercy, but because of what the Catholic Church teaches regarding the forgiveness of sin and Holy Communion. Regarding the forgiveness of sin, the Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that we can be forgiven of our sins, both mortal and venial, even before going to confession by making a perfect act of contrition. Now that's provided we get to confession as soon as we reasonably can. All right, so what's perfect contrition? Well, that's our sorrow for our sins that arises out of our love for God above all else. All right, but how do we get that love? Well, we have some special help right now during this pandemic. For instance, there's no doubt that it's helping us to see just how fragile the securities of this world are and how fragile our lives are. It's helping us realize, perhaps more than ever, that this world is passing. But more importantly, the gift of Divine Mercy Sunday reminds us that we are made by a God of love, a God who's always looking at us with love and who's hoping on the great feast of his mercy that we will look up from this valley of tears and see his beauty and goodness that surpasses all else. He's hoping that we realize that we have not loved him as we should love him. He's hoping that we'll tell him we're sorry for our sins in an act of perfect contrition and that we'll make a firm resolution to put him first. If we do all that and then get to confession as soon as we reasonably can, then we're ready to receive the great grace of Divine Mercy Sunday, even if we can't get to Mass. And how do we receive it? By making a spiritual communion. And what is that? It's to express a desire to the Lord to receive into our hearts the fullness of the love he wants to give us. It's simply to ask Jesus to please come into our hearts with his love. And it doesn't require a written out prayer. You can simply speak to the Lord from your heart, telling him that you desire him to come into your heart through spiritual communion. It's pretty simple, but very powerful, especially on Divine Mercy Sunday. Oh, and by the way, if you have any doubts about whether or not we really can do this, I want to assure you that St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians in the history of the church, writes that to receive Christ spiritually through desire is, quote, not merely to eat Christ spiritually, but likewise to eat this sacrament. In other words, to make a heartfelt spiritual communion is to receive the grace of the sacrament of the Eucharist. And today, as I've said, that grace comes with a great grace, the great grace of a total cleansing of all of our sins and the punishment due to sin. And it gives us a beautiful opportunity to begin again. I hope this presentation has comforted you during this difficult time and all of us here from the National Shrine of Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, pray that you will have a very grace-filled Divine Mercy Sunday. God bless you.